Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for the Horse Trust webinar on the APBC's new assessment process for becoming an animal behaviour technician and a clinical animal behaviourist. Um, we're just going to do a poll to start us off this evening, if that's okay. So we'd like to know, we've um, got two questions for you. So um, which, which um, kind of profession are you most interested in finding out more about, the animal behaviour technician or the clinical animal behaviourist? And where are you in your journey to becoming a registered professional in that, in that role? Just leave that open for a minute. Okay, so most people are here to learn about CAB, but we have got a few people interested in the ABT role. And um, Fab, most of you are working towards achieving the knowledge and understanding requirements. So that's, that's brilliant. Okay, so I think we'll get started. Um, thanks for joining us for the next instalment in the Horse Trust webinar series on the route to becoming a clinical animal behaviourist. I'm Leanne Preshaw, the Equine Quality of Life and Research Director at the Trust. We're running these webinars because having more qualified and competent equine behaviour professionals will help to improve the welfare of horses across the UK by giving owners more access to evidence-based behavioural advice for their horses. And I, I think it's fair to say that the route to becoming a CAB or potentially an ABT um, prior to um, the APBC's new process is quite confusing. Um, and there are so many acronyms involved in everything we do and say about um, equine behaviour and animal behaviour. So our aim for these webinars is to try and make the process simpler and clearer so you all know how to get there. And before I hand over to Jane, I'm just going to provide a little bit more background. So there are currently two routes available to people wanting to become an equine clinical animal behaviourist or CAB, registered with the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, the ABTC, more acronyms. Um, and the ABTC is the regulatory body for animal behaviourists and trainers. OK, so the first route is the Association for the Study of Animal Behaviour, ASAB, has an assessment pathway that leads to ASAB accreditation as a clinical animal behaviourist. And if you're a member of the practitioner organisation, the Fellowship of Animal Behaviour Clinicians, you'll typically go through that route, but not always. Um, and Natalie Light from ASAB's done some webinars for us on this route, um, and those are free to access on our website, on the Horse Trust website. And the other route is to go um, through the new assessment process for the Association of Pet Behaviour Counsellors, the APBC. And that's what Jane's going to be talking about tonight. And in this webinar, we're also going to be discussing the route to becoming an animal behaviour technician. And Jane's going to talk a little bit more about um, that role and what's involved and what you could do as an animal behaviour technician. Um, so I hope that'll set the scene a little bit for this evening's webinar. So we're kindly joined by Jane Williams. Um, Jane completed the postgraduate diploma in companion animal behaviour counselling at the University of Southampton. She's got a master by research at the same institution. Um, she's been a full member of the APBC since 2009. She was its chair from 2017 to 2020. Um, she's currently an APBC committee member and head of the assessment team. She's got a whole list of qualifications on here. Um, she's <laughs> awesome. Um, she's also an ABTC registered clinical animal behaviorist and animal training instructor. And she was the ABTC chair from 2018 to 2020. She's currently a trustee and its secretary. So literally we couldn't get anyone better to give us the full picture. Um, and I have to add this bit. So Jane lives in Essex with 30 tortoises. Wow. Six dogs, Harry the rabbit and another equally animal mad human. I like the fact there's another, you know, the other human has to be animal mad. Um, fab. OK, so just very quickly, a few housekeeping issues. You can post questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, Jane's slides are split into sections. At the end of each section, she's going to ask um, and answer questions for you. So type the questions in as they occur. Um, we're going to be recording the webinar and it will be available for you to rewatch afterwards. Oh, before I forget, um, make sure you type your questions in the Q&A, not the chat box, because we might not see them. Um, OK, so um, we're going to start recording and hand over to Jane. Thanks very much, Leanne. Um, and thank you very much for inviting uh, me on behalf of the APBC to share with you our new assessment route, because we are really excited about it, because it's taken a lot of hard work to get here, as I'm sure you can imagine. 
Um, but the key thing that um, we have, have tried to achieve in our new assessment route is that it is accessible. So as um, a practitioner organisation and an assessing organisation within the Annual Behaviour and Training Council, as you say, uh, we have a responsibility to uphold standards for both the animal behaviour technician, which is a relatively new um, role that we're, we're assessing for, and also for clinical animal behaviours. But we are very, very keen to support people in engaging with the process. We're thrilled that the Horse Trust is working with us uh, on webinars and also um, that we've been invited to contribute to today and um, because we do have a number of um, specifically uh, trained and qualified horse behaviorists and we would love to have some more. Um, so uh, it's really great that you've invited us and I look forward to sharing um, my experiences and um, hopefully clarifying uh, our assessment process for you and please do as Leanne says ask questions I've put in three pauses for you to ask questions about each section because as she says um, it kind of feel a bit daunting and a bit um, overwhelming in terms of the information that you're trying to absorb with this but um, if you take it slowly um, it becomes uh, clearer and I'm like I say going to do my best to set it out for you and explain to you that what we're about above everything is giving people who've got um, the qualifications and they've got the experience the opportunity to become um, to be assessed as ABTs or CABs um, through through our new assessment route and um, we have got a number of things to support people which I'll talk about um, we've got lots of um, supporting resources which I'll also share with you um, and we're really, really keen to, um, as I say, support people. We don't want to fail people through this process. What we want to do is to get people to a place where they realize that they're ready for assessment and then take them through that process uh, with us, okay? So this is something we're trying to do together rather than something we're trying to do to you, <laughs> um, if I could put it like that. So um, the slides, um, as Leon says, are available, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll share my screen and, and, and use the slides as a, as a structure. Just bear with me because technologically I'm always a bit challenged here. Right. Uh, While you're looking for that, I'm just going to say I'm going to apologise to everybody now. I have a really bad cough that I can't get rid of. So I'm, you're either going to see me coughing in the background or I'm going to be coughing in front of you. So I'm really sorry. We're, we're good. We, we, we just hope you're all right, Leanne. Uh, one there we go. Um, can you all see that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, great. So the, 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 this is, um, as Leanne said, part of your series. So um, this evening then, um, it's APVC assessments that we've already um, set out and and that's been said uh, about me and my background, so I'll move straight on. So, um, first of all, the context of the APBC, the Association of Pet Behaviour Counsellors within the Animal Behaviour and Training Council. So the APBC is one of the founder members of the ABTC. It is uh, committed to the ABTC as the regulator uh, of our industry uh, across this um, sector. We are also a practitioner organization. That is, we have uh, the ability to register full members as clinical animal behaviorists. We also have the ability to register full members um, as animal behavior technicians on the ABTC registers. And we're an assessing organization for both parts of the ABTC standards, which collectively um, describe what knowledge and understanding you need and what um, clinical competence you need to demonstrate through the performance criteria for each of those two um, roles. Like Leanne said, there's so many acronyms in here um, and I will keep saying what they mean. Apologies to those of you who are, are more familiar, but I think it is quite important so that everyone is kind of at the same level of uh, understanding of all this. So 
let's just um, mention then the two roles. Clinical animal behavior is probably the one that you're more familiar with. Um, and the idea is that uh, someone who is a clinical animal behaviorist can take on any uh, type of unwanted behavior, all types of uh, undesirable, inappropriate, problematic, potentially dangerous. And of course, when we're in the equine world, um, everything's potentially dangerous because horses are such large and powerful animals. We always work on veterinary referral and we may work uh, and often do work in conjunction with animal trainers or animal training instructors for um, specific rehabilitation uh, type training. So um, as you'll see in a moment, the standards for the knowledge and understanding bit of the standards, which I'll come to, um, is at level six for that um, role which is the end of uh, a degree qualification. The second role is the animal behavior technician, which again um, is about working with owners, handlers, and the animal to prevent unwanted behaviors, to address unwanted behaviors, again, on veterinary referral. But the knowledge and understanding for animal behavior technician is set at level five and um, the ABTC, and I know this from the work that I'm doing with them rather than APBC, um, the standards for ABT have just been slightly revised um, and developed, and they clearly focus now on um, uh, working with uh, owners, handlers, or whatever it may be, um, including um, the development of, uh, I'll say, uh, uh, these unwanted behaviors. It's also about um, preventative um, work and specifically focus on, on um, people who have a role perhaps within the veterinary profession as vet nurses, and also for people particularly who work in um, rescue situations with animals and where there are complexities of the case and where dangerous behaviors are involved the expectation would be that an animal behavior technician would be working with a CAB or a veterinary behaviorist that's a VB um, to to uh, address the behaviors so there would be certain things particularly in relation to be dangerous behaviors that an animal behavior technician wouldn't do and as I say, the knowledge and understanding is set at level five. So if you look at the uh, ABTC standards, um, obviously they're available on their website and I've also um, provided the APBC information for applicants um, as a PDF file for you to access from tonight. And that sets out the standards also. Um, so what you have is an overview which sets out the framework for the role and puts it in context within the sector. And um, so, as I said, clinical animal behaviorist um, to deal with uh, any kind of uh, unwanted behavior uh, or, or, or you should be able to deal with anything basically. Uh, and ABT, which um, as is more defined as more uh, limited in terms of not dealing with uh, dangerous dangerous behaviors. So then we have the knowledge and understanding. That sets out what you need to know and understand, funnily enough, that's why it's called knowledge and understanding, um, at a given level. So for CAB, it would be level six, and for animal behavior technician, it would be level five. Um, and the courses, qualifications, and experiences that you have achieved, um, that can all be used to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. The second part of the standards then are when you've, you've got that knowledge and understanding, you've uh, developed your skills, you've had some experience, you can then demonstrate your clinical skills, your ability to apply and demonstrate um, that knowledge and understanding in your actual day-to-day -day role as a CAB or an ABT. So that is about application of your um, knowledge and understanding in the clinical role. Um, 
<clears throat> in relation to those roles and in relation to our application process, the APBC has three membership levels, which um, it's useful for you to um, understand. The first level is student for those studying to achieve the knowledge and understanding. So for the people who are taking courses and are involved in still, it's making sure that they've got all the knowledge and understanding that are set out in those ABTC standards. Um, and currently the cost of student membership is um, £50 a year. <clears throat> um, the second uh, membership level to mention is provisional membership level. Um, and that's when you've achieved the knowledge and understanding. So you've now completed your study and your courses. This is not to say that you won't carry on doing CPD because obviously that's a requirement, but you're now developing your clinical skills through experience and perhaps doing more specific CPD. So um, in the case of uh, equine work, for example, you might be um, focusing particularly on aspects of uh, horse work. And then the third level is full membership for those who have achieved both the knowledge and understanding and have developed their clinical skills, gained enough experience, and now feel ready for assessment against the performance criteria. And the two um, costs for those membership levels are listed there. So 95 pounds for provisional members and 160 pounds for uh, full members. So let's start to look at the ABTC standards then and how they are dealt with in terms of our assessment process. The first part then would be to uh, achieve what we describe as our provisional membership level. And in order to do that, you have to um, demonstrate that you have uh, all the knowledge and understanding, as I say, as set out in the standards, either the CAB or ABT. I've just uh, focused on CAB in this section, but obviously the uh, same principles apply for ABT uh, at level five. And on the ABTC website, you will find a list of courses that are recognised at level six um, as covering all the knowledge and understanding parts of the standard. So if you have one of these uh, qualifications, <clears throat> you would uh, make your application to us and say, I've got um, this, the BSc honours animal science, pet behaviour and welfare, at Riddle University and um, you've done the module pathway that takes you to um, the, the, that, that degree level and, and, and therefore that's all you need to do. You need to provide us with your certificate and that is it. However, lots of people haven't done those courses and um, may be studying on other uh, courses um, and so we've tried to give the opportunity widen um, the opportunity, because obviously that list of courses that's recognised by ABTC is relatively small. And we're encouraging more course providers to um, go forward and get their courses recognised so that list will grow. But, but as it stands, there are still a lot of people doing courses uh, out there that are not on the list. So you may then be trying to demonstrate the knowledge and understanding by achievement of non-recognised but assessed courses at level six. So that could be um, a degree course at another university, for example, um, or from another provider, but still assessed and shown to be at level six. So that's one option. The second option is for people who have achieved their knowledge and understanding in different ways from a variety of sources and they may well be non-recognized, non-assessed courses. They may involve self-directed learning and experience. And that whole thing is called APEL, Accreditation of Prior Experience and Learning. And if you want to try to demonstrate that you have all the knowledge and understanding for either CAB or ABT, through these two types of um, uh, course and experience, then what you would need to do would be to map um, to the ABTC standards 
um, your coverage of that knowledge and understanding. And we have uh, a mapping the document for that purpose, which is um, made available. And basically it asks for uh, the type of evidence that you have, um, the source, was it, was it a course? Did someone provide it um, or was it self-learning? Um, what's the level of that learning where you know it? Um, when did you achieve it? And then we have something called a reflective accounts form. And the idea is that you would complete one of those forms for each of the knowledge areas within the, sta the standards in which you describe what you've done, what you've learned from the learning experience. Uh, and um, you could add supporting evidence to go with that, but you would definitely be asked to complete a reflective accounts form for uh, evidence like this of non-recognized and non-assessed courses. And in the case of two and three, where you're putting together several reflective accounts forms, um, you, you've mapped the document, you think you've covered everything, um, we are going to conduct some interviews with you to confirm that you have that knowledge and understanding. And that would be carried out by the assessments team and the membership inquiries team that we have at um, APBC. So it doesn't sound that tricky. Um, and I think one of the issues is that there are a lot of courses out there. There's, there's a huge amount of uh, available courses at the moment. Um, and people don't really know which way to go. What are the, are the, uh, the, the most appropriate ones that are gonna help them to get this knowledge and understanding. So to achieve the first part uh, of the assessment process, to get under their belt, as it were, the knowledge and understanding that they need in order to be a CAB or an ABT. So um, I'll take some questions on that. I just need to escape from this so that I can see if there's any uh, questions that people- I was gonna say, um, I, I, you, you can go back into it, Jane. I can read the questions out to you. That's, that's fine. Oh, is that okay? Got, okay. Yeah, yeah. not a problem. Um, so we haven't got any questions in at the moment, but um, I just want to say, so I'm massively excited about the APEL stuff. Yeah. I've been talking a lot recently to some experienced mm -hmm. behaviourists who have met um, through academic um, qualifications, most of the knowledge and understanding requirements, but say have some gaps. And this could be a real game changer for those people who say can't um, go back and Mm. Two additional university courses. So, is mm. there any chance? You, oh, not any chance. Is it, could you just provide a little bit more information about sort of how people could demonstrate, um, say, self-directed learning, or, or, or what kind of courses that you might consider for APEL? Because this is really exciting. I am really sad, but I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I'll give you a couple of examples of applications that we've seen sort of recently, which which might um, sort of answer that that kind of um, question. Um, and um, I would say that um, obviously for, there is, for example, um, the course that I did at Southampton, um, the postgraduate diploma, it no longer exists, so it can't be recognised. However, um, clearly that would be one where you would very straightforwardly be able to map to um, that, that, that knowledge and understanding, as yeah. that course was very closely aligned um, with the standards, in fact standards might have been very well <laughs> closely aligned to the course actually but anyway yeah. um so 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 that would be one example and there may be as you say um people who've done uh, qualifications and courses a long time ago that you know didn't uh they don't have a huge amount in terms of evidence of that and so that's why we're asking them to um complete the reflective accounts uh, form which basically asks you um you know what 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 did you do um what uh, what did you what did you learn based on this knowledge and understanding section and as i say what have you uh, what have you learned from it and uh it we certainly have seen applicants recently where um, they perhaps done a lot on um clinical procedures if you look at the the standards they've done quite a lot on perhaps behavior um, and, and learning and training but perhaps because that was their focus 
they haven't done a lot on the counseling skills or the, the human communication skills. So in that case, they could um, provide evidence of the, uh, or, or more formal evidence of, of those aspects of the knowledge and understanding, but not, as I say, the psychology, the, the, the human counseling. So then they would complete a reflective uh, accounts form for those sections, and that would be the focus of our interviews. Okay. So, to check out their uh, knowledge and understanding of those aspects. In terms of um, sort of types of courses, well, as I said, they, um, I think the difficulty at these higher levels, level five and level six, level five is obviously second year uh, degree, basically equivalence, and then level six, the third year, is that it's, it, it can be quite difficult for people to, to demonstrate that level of, of understanding without formally assessed um, qualifications and courses. But, um, it, and it, but it may be that they just, as I say, have a gap in one area yeah. of the knowledge and understanding. So they can be directed to um, a specific course module, um, for example, that they can then do as a specific course and access it um, re remotely without actually, you know, going physically somewhere to study. I know we've got restrictions on that now, but... Um, yeah. you know, one of the issues in the past was that uh, um, a lot of the things that were listed on that ABTC um, course list was you had to go and live in Lincoln and do the yeah. MSc full time <laughs> for two years or whatever. You know, things have moved on since then and that was not practical and people were not going to be able to do it. So we have got things like the, um, the modules at Riddle, we've got the Compass uh, remote courses and so on. And then there, there are more providers looking at... Um, you know, getting their courses listed in, in that sort of way. So yeah. does that help a bit? No, I think it does. I think it does. Because yeah. when we've talked about this previously, I think one of the challenges has been people might have, say, a gap just on one of those um, sections and they've got everything else covered. Mm. And you, there aren't the, the recognised courses quite often won't ever let you do that one module yeah. that will fill the gaps. So you have to do a whole course. A whole course, yeah. Well, that's thousands more pounds to try and do it. So this, this yeah. would potentially offer a much more flexible... That, yeah that's what we that's what we're trying to to aim at um a, a more accessible and flexible route but at the same time as i said we know that we do have to maintain the standards and be satisfied that people have somehow um yeah. covered that knowledge and understanding but the somehow is 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 a bigger uh, opportunity yeah. i think than it probably was before yeah that's really exciting um, yeah. I have got another question from um, Jennifer. She's yeah. currently a provisional member since 2012 and yeah. did a non-recognised degree. So BSc mm -hmm. honours in animal uh, behaviour from LJMU. I'm not quite sure what that is, so I apologise. Um, just currently joined the Compass course level five. Is this something she should do to become a CAB or an ABT? So, so the level five Compass course would be take her to ABT? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's at level five. Yeah. That's it. Okay, fab. So yes, that would get. So, but to 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 go to for cab, she would need a level six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, um, Li I, Liverpool John Moore's University. Oh, Thank Liverpool you, John Moore's. Yeah, I was trying to think <laughs> what the uh, what the the letters were. Yeah. L J M. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Fab. Yeah. No. Fab. And so, um, as I say, that's uh, that's we're trying to open up the the, the possibility of using. Um, learning experiences, as I said, from other other uh, other programs, other courses, other qualifications. And as I say, some of them are historical in that sense. Yeah. Um, and and but then no less valid. Yeah. Yeah. I know um I did my course my degree masters a long, long time ago and we didn't have learning outcomes then. So for me to try and fill in a form with learning outcomes is a bit of a challenge. Um okay, right. We'll crack on then. Over back over to you. Well, so, yeah, what I always say about the, the uh, filling in the um, the form and everything is that um, we are we are working on um, get, uh, getting together some examples of completed reflective uh, uh, accounts forms so that people can see the type of things. Yeah. That, so we will make those available as soon as we develop them. But um, brilliant. This is this part is changing fairly quickly, so we are yeah. responding to the changes and. 
um, trying to make it as accessible as possible, as early as possible, really. Yeah, no, okay. brilliant. Right then, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back to this then. Now, uh, where are we? Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so thank you for the questions on that. And um, if other things occur to you even about this later, then don't feel that you, you know, you've missed the opportunity to just ask whenever. I just thought it would be useful to split it up like this. So um, moving on then, um, once <clears throat> you become a, a provisional member uh, and uh, you've demonstrated your knowledge and understanding, then you um, can get, uh, need to get a uh, clinical experience and, um, you know, develop your skills. And when you feel that you've done that, you can ask them to be assessed against the performance criteria, which is part two of the process, to give you um, full membership. And so we've developed uh, quite a lot of resources to support people in understanding this part of the process as well. And uh, <clears throat> we've got uh, an application information document, which I've made available to you. We've got uh, a checklist, which I can look at with you uh, also. So basically we've set out exactly what information you need to provide in terms of your uh, application process. We've got example case records, so I think there's quite a big emphasis and a, and a change um, perhaps from things that you're familiar with previously, if you looked at pre, uh, other, other routes before. We're not um, looking at anything that you might call a case study. We are not interested in studies. We're interested in real life cases and how you conduct yourself as a CAB or an ABT um, when working with clients, owners, uh, trainers, whatever. Uh, and so I'll detail for you in the next few slides what those case record examples are like, but they're called case records and they are nothing to do with studying. They are to do with uh, actual cases that you've been involved in. Then we've got um, a couple of uh, vlogs from, from two of our uh, members and assessment um, team people to try and kind of take you through the process. And I'm gonna just show you a couple of minutes of Nicole's vlog in a moment. We've also done a, a mock interview so that you can see uh, for yourself what an, the interview situation might be like. We've also got an interview um, which I'll show you a couple of minutes of, and all of these things are going to be made available to you after this, this webinar as well through the Horse Trust, so thank you for that. Um, an interview with Claire Klimmer, who was one of the first people to go through the new assessment process, and she, uh, her experience is particularly relevant because she is uh, an equine behaviourist. And then we have Q&A sessions as part of our own um, webinar uh, sessions that are available to people to come and ask the assessments team um, specific things that they'd like to know. And we've also just put in place the opportunity to get support from assessment advisors who can actually uh, support you by looking at your evidence um, with you and taking you through uh, what the assessment process involves, including setting up a mock interview with you. So I'm just gonna come out of this and uh, try and find, um, um, hold on, <laughs> the, the other, uh, this, oh yeah, this is the mock interview, oops, lost that. So if I can just show you that, I don't know if you can, oh, my screen sharing's paused, I've managed to do that then, wait a minute. There's a new share apparently I have to do, sorry. So this is a little bit of the mock interview that we've done as a, 
This is an APBC uh, practice interview for use in training purposes. So um, I am Jenny, one of the assessors today, working with my colleague Rebecca, the other assessor, and our applicant for today is Chloe. So welcome, Chloe. Thank you very much indeed for making this application to the APBC for a full assessment for assessment as a CAB, as a full member. Very grateful to you. Uh, for going through the process with us. We hope that um, so far you've found that the feedback that you've had has been helpful. We've given you feedback on the written and the uh, video evidence that you already sent us in relation to your three dog cases. So thank you very much for that. Um, what we're doing today is we are recording the interview for the purposes of our records and because you have kindly agreed that we can use this evidence for further assessor training. So thank you very much indeed for that also. Um, we will be taking you through the performance criteria where we've indicated to you from on the feedback that either you haven't yet been able to send us the written or video evidence that we need to confirm that you um, can demonstrate those performance criteria or the ones on the form which say P, P meaning you've partially demonstrated them, but not fully. So we'll be exploring some of that with you a bit, bit more fully today. And um, I would say that this is a professional dialogue, is a conversation. So please try and relax and um, give us uh, the fullest answers that, that you can. And if there's anything at all that's unclear that um, myself, Jenny or Rebecca says, then just please ask. So anything from you, Rebecca, um, because I think you're starting with the first questions where we're starting um, with the first section on welfare and, and legislation within the, the group uh, group of the performance criteria. OK, <clears throat> so that's a little bit of the um, mock interview. And I was just going to show you a little bit of the. What? I don't even find if this is the right thing on here. Is that it? No, that's not it. Sorry. Uh, hang on. I thought I had. Uh, I thought I had ready here. Um, no. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can get to it. Sorry. Don't Let's worry. Oh, there it is. Um, hang on. Let me just see. Well, I've got it now, but I don't know if you've got it. Wait a minute. Um, a minute. Let's get back on here. Try that again. Might have to do screen sharing again, maybe. Yeah, hang on. That's it. There we go. I have to go on here and then right, I'll try this. Mm, the interview's on go slow here. Here we go. Sorry. So must get a mouse on here. <laughs> no. <laughs> there we are. So I really hate watching myself. These are awful. I know. I know what you mean. So, these okay. techniques always work really well in, in theory, don't they? Yeah. Can anyone else see the video? Is it just me that can't? Oh, sorry. Um, it's just coming it's off paused. as a Sorry. That's all right. It's just coming off as a black screen, so I wasn't no. sure if it was just me. No, no. Can you okay. hear it? I can hear bits of it, but not. I um, can't. I won't. Is that Claire Cleaner's video? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can put that on um, we, on our um, website. It's a link for people if, if you can't get it to work now. OK, let me just. Um, sorry, let me turn it off on my uh, I'll try and turn it off on mine. Hang on. There you go. Right. I've stopped it. So, yeah, if you if you if you can share it, that would be really yeah. useful. Just a couple of minutes of it. 
Sorry about oh, we, that. We, we, no, it's okay. We can share the whole thing on our, on our website. That's fine. Okay, great. So um, that, that uh, basically the, um, the interview is uh, Claire uh, talking about how she felt um, quite supported by the process and that she thought it was much clearer um, than she expected even and that the feedback that she got was quite useful to her as well as being part of the assessment process. And one of the things I, I've definitely um, realized very early on in this process is that um, it is an absolute privilege to be an assessor uh, in this context and to um, be able to share experiences and practical approaches and skills and so on with applicants. And I learn as much from the people that I'm interviewing as, as you know, that they're getting out of the process. So it's a two way street and it, it does work very well. Um, we're really keen to emphasize that our assessment process is based on um, the, the assessment being supportive. Um, they are a professional dialogue, as I said in that mock interview, they, it's, it's not an interrogation, it's a, an opportunity for you to explain your thinking and rationale. Um, the assessments are objective, they are based entirely on the performance criteria of the ABTC standards and nothing else. Um, they're fair, the assessment decisions are carried out by two assessors, as agreed between the APBC and the applicant. So, when you make your application, you are given the information about who the assessors will be. If you have any reason at all for not being comfortable with that, you can say so and it will be changed. Um, transparent, so the feedback on which performance criteria have been met, which are yet to be met, is clearly given at every stage. And I'll take you through the stages in a moment. And the feedback, as I say, is timely. So you get the feedback, uh, within days of uh, each stage of the process as agreed and um, the last stages of the process of the oral interviews um, and the outcome of the process is the, the decision is given to people within days of that being completed. So this um, <clears throat> assessment uh, the against the performance criteria um, as a CAB is not species specific. Um, so it is about us assessing you either as a clinical animal behaviorist or an animal behavior technician, the role. Um, clearly you may uh, choose to only work with one species or one or two species, and that's absolutely fine. But when we are carrying out the assessment, we do look at uh, the performance criteria, for example, uh, number one, um, talks about covering the needs of a range of animal species and protecting and promoting welfare across species. So even if you're focusing on dogs or horses, um, you will be asked about uh, a range of species, um, not necessarily a detailed understanding of every single species, but to be aware of for example, if you come across multi-species um, households, uh, I guess in, the, in, in an equine setting also, um, people keep um, horses and donkeys together and so on. Um, so it, understanding the need to pr protect and promote welfare across species is essential and that's part of the assessment process. You are required to show that you can train animals humanely and to handle them safely. And um, as I said in the CAB role, obviously we're going to talk about um, safe, well, working safely, carrying out risk assessments. That's part of the process as well, the assessment process, and um, working safely with animals that are uh, potentially dangerous. There's also in performance criteria in 22, a reference to being aware of your own limitations and to know when to refer cases on. So for example, um, if someone phones me up and asks me to help them with their horse, I would clearly refer that on because I am not an equine um, behaviorist. 
However, there could be other reasons why I might not feel that I was the best person to take a case. And it could be to do with um, the client or their needs or uh, any aspect of the case could be a reason for referring on. But you need to be really clear about when to do that. And that's part of the assessment process. So um, to help you um, understand what's required, in, we have put together a checklist. Um, you've got this, it's in the, uh, the document um, that I provided um, for you to look at. Um, it's a long document, by the way, but it has got several versions of the standards in it. So that's why it's so long. And we are continuously looking at this stuff and revising it and updating it. So I think we're gonna shorten this, this document and take the standards out and make them separate based on um, feedback that we've had. But basically the assessment checklist here, um, you use it for each of the three cases that you're required to um, put forward as case records. And then it talks you through the fact that you need evidence of veterinary referral, um, evidence of carrying out risk assessment, how you gather the history, how you communicate with clients and other professionals, and what your thinking and rationale is for dealing with the case. And this is described as optional. And the reason that it's optional is that you don't have to um, write that down. We've tried to make the process as uh, flexible as possible. And if you're the type of person who would prefer to talk us through that as part of your an interview, you can. So if you prefer to write a lot and put a lot of detail down, you can do that. If you prefer to write less and explain what's going on and why you've done the things that you've done through the oral interview, you can do that. There, there is that flexibility it is, a, is, is a choice. And you're also required as the standards ask for um, you to record your CPD in the last six months and then what you intend to do going forward. And we also, given the current situation, obviously video evidence is, is what we're doing at the moment, but we have found it, whoops, we have found it to be um, very effective uh, as a means of assessment. And also it's relatively straightforward for people to get their practice assessed uh, and, and recorded through, through video evidence. So what we're asking for is video evidence of you carrying out your role as a behavior counselor or an animal behavior technician um, for, for one case. Um, so uh, helping owners and, and, and clients, how have you gathered the evidence? How have you um, clarified with them the information that they've given you? How have you coached them and guided them and instructed them? in the steps that they need to take in order to address the unwanted behaviors. And we will also um, ask for videos of training, um, you, you training animals, but you also coaching um, owners and handlers to, to, uh, to carry out training as well. So the steps then that you um, need to go through are to complete the application form. It's fairly straightforward. It doesn't ask for very much detail except for your uh, things like your name and address and so on. And then uh, details of your uh, certificates and the a APEL process. So if you've uh, already become a provisional member, that, that's, that bit's already done. If you haven't done that, then you go through the process I've already described. Once conservation, confirmation of the knowledge and understanding is completed, you'll then send three written case records plus your video evidence to the APBC office, and then you'll be allocated two trained assessors. And um, I would stop there and just emphasize what's in bold there, trained assessors. Um, in the past, I think it's probably fair to say that not enough uh, work and effort has been put into training the people who've been given this role of, of assessors. That is not the case now. Um, with this process, we've spent considerable amount of time and effort um, uh, identifying suitable assessors, training them, taking them through the process themselves. They get to 
observe other experienced assessors. They get to observe interviews to review the evidence themselves. Um, and they are supported fully in the training process before they um, start to work with another experienced assessor and carry out assessments themselves. So I think that's a hugely important point. So um, in terms of the written evidence and what we've done here is um, just list what's on that um, checklist. So three case records, you need to go across the species that you intend to work with. If you only intend to work with horses, then you might well submit three horse cases uh, and that, that, is, that is acceptable. Um, you need to cover a range of behaviour issues and um, they need to be wide enough in scope to give you the opportunity to demonstrate the performance criteria. So what I'm saying there is it's not necessarily an advantage to go for the things that you think are the simple, straightforward ones because they don't necessarily give you that scope to demonstrate all the performance criteria and the skills and qualities and, and, and the, you know, the, the uh, skills that you have. So um, think about that. And it's one of the things that your assessment advisor could work with you on if you needed that support and help um, to, to help you with, with, um, with the type of cases that would be useful. Um, you need evidence of veterinary referral, as I've said, risk assessments, how you gather history and data, um, evidence of communications with clients and other professionals. I mean, that can include, include, include um, vets, um, physiotherapists, uh, farriers in, in the horse world or, or, or whatever. Um, and then, as I said, your rationale for how you've gone about dealing with a given case you can set that down and give it to us in written form if you want, or it can be one of the focuses of the interview uh, interviews. And uh, we also need your CPD records. Um, so that would be, you'd, you'd send us those, and you'd also at the same time send us some video evidence. So consultation from a case, information gathering, uh, consultation from a case, follow-up session, preferably the same case, but because of the, uh, current COVID restrictions, we've been fairly flexible about that. Review of progress, explanations to clients, updates and reviews. Um, videos of you handling and training animals, including um, training three cues with some progression of, of the, those training activities. And then you coaching clients to carry out training exercises as well. So those are the videos. Um, so let me pause there. There's another grazer for you. That's what Sol Carter taught us. Um, and um, see if there's any um, further questions. Fab, we haven't got one. So um, Jennifer's asked, how do we develop the skills to be clear in our own limitations? If we lack confidence in our own ability, would this be a reason to refer on? Yeah. Um, so if you, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a case and thinking, mm, you know, I'm not, totally sure how I'm going to approach this. Um, it's something new to me perhaps and uh, not a um, type of case I've come across before. Um, then yes, I mean, you know, you could um, seek help from or support from other uh, professionals. Um, but we do have support within the APBC in terms of that skill development process. So I was gonna come on to that later, but I'll just mention it now. We have um, support groups that um, meet online and discuss cases um, to give people the opportunity to explore, you know, those kind of things and people can take cases to it. Um, so even for example, in the example you gave, say, um, you were asked to take a case and you didn't feel confident about it and you referred it on to another professional, but you wanted to know how you would deal with that sort of thing in the future, then you could take that case, even though you haven't gone through it yourself, um, to, that, to those support groups. We've also got local support groups as that, well, they used to be local because we used to physically get together. 
now we're kind of doing What's that it like <laughs> oh, yeah now we're doing it online <laughs> uh, we none of us can remember actually we did one yeah we did one um yesterday and it was like oh this is really weird um or, or, that we can, that we can't actually get together yet um but we so we in the sense of local we used to do um east of england that is where i'm located so we used to do a group there but now we're going to include people from east london and stuff as well and make it a bit wider because obviously we're physically not getting together so we can invite more people in this part of the world to to, to, to join us so we've got support groups um like say we've got local groups and then we've got um the assessment advisors but as I said, I'll, I'll come to them later, but they are, are very much focused on this assessment process itself. Does that answer the question? I, th I think that was a, a good answer. Um, with your support, with the, with the case kind of support groups, do you have any ones that are sort of specifically horses or would cover where you'd have sort of equine cabs in the in the discussion to bring equine cases to? Yeah, I, I, I think actually that... Um, we, we at the moment they're sort of fairly uh i think they're fairly general but i think that going forward having groups that are species specific um is, is going to be an, another way that they develop and uh when you all you when you all join and and go through this process and and uh, or even join as, as students or for or whatever um you know swell those those uh numbers we have a number of equine behaviors but you know the more that we have then the more we can use your expertise and and share what you know and include more equine based events so yeah i i would definitely feed into the committee uh, apbc committee one of the things from tonight will be um when are we setting up support groups for horses and cats Yay! Uh, so that would be fab. I, I will definitely take that away from here and I can pretty much guarantee that that will be well received and people will try and do that. Brilliant. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, I've got another question. Um, Charlotte has asked, uh, could you give us some examples of the behavioural issues you'd be looking for in the case records? I know um, <laughs> with ASAB, they specified the kind of behaviour cases they they wanted they had sort of an essential and a desirable list do you do that or is it more no, it's entirely up to you we consider that you are a professional person that you um can make your own decisions with regard to that sort of thing um in the sense that that as i say we, we do need you to cover a range of behavior issues and and uh problems otherwise you won't give yourself enough scope to cover uh, all aspects of the performance criteria. However, um, one of the key things about level six, which I talked about earlier, is, is, is this dealing with um, aggression um, type of cases. So if for uh, any reason you didn't include um, a case that involved that kind of behavior, you would definitely be questioned about that in the oral interviews. And one of the techniques that we use quite a lot in the oral interviews is we give you other um, case scenarios. So um, we sometimes say, oh, look, you know, you, you've given us an example here of a noise phobic dog. Um, so then we would want to explore with the person other types of phobias as well, um, that the, it, it, given that their case focused particularly on, on noises. Um, and then we would probably include, um, I, 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 this is based on just one case, obviously they, they, they could cover it in their other cases, but we would then also um, ask them uh, questions about um you know fear-based aggression different types of um uh, likely responses from, from animals um driven by driven by fear for example and some of them would show aggressive responses some of them would potentially show more uh withdrawn and learned helplessness type 
um, responses. Um, but we, you know, we anything that isn't within the cases, we will explore with you within the context of the performance criteria um, in various different ways through the oral interviews. That's brilliant. I know sometimes, you know, you can't always control what cases directly no. come into you. So, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to sometimes get a specified type of case. Um, I did have a question. I think I know the answer to this one. Um, but if you do you have specified that kind of the number of cases you have had to have seen before you can apply. So I know. No. Um, OK, so um, just for the audience. So I know with the, the ASAP process, you've got to submit sort of two years worth of records no. and they then select cases. So you don't do that. No, but okay. but what we like, I said, we want to be very upfront, very transparent about the process. People need to understand that. That it is rig rigorous that the you know that the standards are the standards and um that that we want to help you through the every means of support that we that we feel is is sensible and appropriate to offer you the opportunity to understand whether or not you are ready for this assessment we don't want you to come forward for it um until you feel uh, ready and com confident um, and that you've got this, the experience uh, that you need. Yeah. Um, we're not in the business here of trying to catch you out. It's not uh, an ambush. It, it is based entirely, as I said, on the standards. Um, and we would much rather you have the support you need to realise that you're not re yet ready, if that is the case. Than, than come forward and, and not be successful yeah. at that particular time. You, you can, of course, um, if that were to happen, um, you would be given full and detailed feedback about what aspects you haven't um, yet met and what you would need to do. But by putting in place the assessment advisors, as I said, I'll talk a bit more about them, um, you know, I think if you, if you signed up to, to get support from, from one of them, uh, the, the yeah. expectation would be that they would be able to highlight for you any gaps yeah. Yeah. In, in, your, in your evidence and potentially your, uh, the performance criteria that you hadn't yet been able to demonstrate so that you know, the, the success rate, we, you know, we want it to, rem to remain as high as as we possibly can, yeah, it, yeah. it possibly can be, so that, like I say, we're not setting people up to failure. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds that sounds good. Um, Jennifer's asked, when is the next intake to apply? She oh, said, I'm coming to that, that. I got the windows in a sec. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, that well, sounds very encouraging, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you for that one. Bob. <laughs> okay, well, I'll hand back to you, Jane. Yeah, I'll go on to the next section then, and then we can do um, the last lot of questions. So, so you've um, so you've submitted your uh, written case records. You've submitted your video evidence, and, and the two assessors will have um, reviewed all that, and they may ask you for something extra if they feel that there is something uh, not included that they that they need to see. But once that has been done, you will get feedback on uh, an assessment checklist um, uh, document. And that will, uh, it basically lists all the performance criteria. And it, it tells you whether or not you've um, met each performance criterion, whether or not you partially met it, or whether or not, um, or, or it's not been met. And um, you get an email then that tells you, all right, these are the ones that you've already met. So in the written evidence and the video evidence we've seen, we're satisfied that, um, for example, um, we have enough evidence in your, in your, from your written case records of performance criterion five. It comes in the section evaluating and modifying behavior. It's the one about gathering evidence about the behavior of the animal and the problems. Um, uh, 
collecting evidence from all sources, um, direct observation, discussion, uh, information from veterinary surgeons, case history, and so on. And then um, the second part of that uh, criteria, because they're sneaky in these ABTC standards, they put two things in the same uh, criteria sometimes. And the second part of it is critically evaluate the quality of this evidence and act appropriately to remedy any areas of concern or deficiency in it. I tell you now that uh, there's, I haven't seen any applica applicants yet who've done that second bit, that critical evaluation, as part of their case records, because it's not what you do when you're recording what is happening with, with the clients. Um, but it is a process that you are going through in your mind and you're um, thinking that through. So. Um, Although you may have uh, shown that you gathered that evidence appropriately so in the written, that bit might be done. But the critical evaluation of the quality of that evidence may not be something that you've written down and included in that, in, in that written evidence. So what you would get for that performance criterion is P. OK, so based on your written and your video evidence, you partially met it. And that means... <clears throat> That you're going to get feedback that says we will we will focus we will focus our questions in the interview on the critical evaluation of the quality of that evidence. Does that give you you know so that's an example, um, and you can uh, look at the recording documents and ask me other questions about other criteria if you want. But that's one example, and so you'll get an email and it will say you've already met performance criteria one two three um, seven. Eight, um, 11, 12, 13, whatever it is. Um, the ones that we haven't yet seen any evidence for are these, um, and the ones that you've only partially covered are these. So the focus of your interviews will be those identified performance criteria um, by those numbers. You will have two or three interviews. Mostly people have two. Um, each is approximately one hour. And then after each interview, you'll get another um, version of the assessment feedback checklist. So it gets updated after the first interview and you get an email telling you now you've demonstrated these performance criteria as well. These are still the ones that we haven't yet covered. So by the time you get to the second interview, hopefully there aren't very many um, left that you haven't um, yet met. So you know exactly what the focus is going to be of each interview in terms of which performance criteria we're gonna be talking about. Um, so the focus of the interviews is gonna vary by individual applicant, as I said, is entirely based on the evidence um, provided. And as far as possible, we try to, as I say, give you the option to, be, to present that evidence in the form that most suits you. One of the things that we put in all our information is that if you have a particular um, requirement, a particular need in terms of um, the, the way in which you want to present this evidence, or if you have any difficulties in presenting evidence in a particular way, tell us what it is and we will do our best to support you to allow you to present your evidence in the way that best suits you. Um, I suppose the... The, sometimes um, the, the most uh, frequently seen example might be someone who um, has some difficulty presenting written evidence, uh, perhaps because of some issue with regard to, to uh, writing. Clearly, they have to be able to overcome that to, to meet the performance criteria in terms of what the standards are for uh, in, in the way that they are uh, presenting written information to the clients about what needs to be done, for example. But um, if the issue is that you are concerned about the way in which you write for the purposes of this, um, then we quite happily um, do the bulk of the assessment through the oral interviews with you rather than expecting you to write a, a great deal. Um, so as it says, if you prefer to write more and then explain um, why you took the approach you did, in written form that's fine if you prefer to talk about what you've done and why you did that and you took that approach in your interview you can do that the only requirement is that through all of your collective evidence that you have met all of the performance criteria 
So I'll say that again. The only requirement is that you have met all the performance criteria. And that doesn't mean that you've met them forever in a day, 55,000 times, 55,000 ways. It means that you have met all of the performance criteria. That is it. Um, so, uh, as I said, for those who've got particular uh, requirements, we do our best to make arrangements. There is an appeals process for anyone who wishes to access it, should they, um, you know, not be happy with the, the result of the assessment process. It is designed to allow applicants to be well prepared, to be very clear about the process, to understand exactly what's required. Um, we, in terms of going back to that question about support, we put on Q and A sessions, as I say, um, for uh, app uh, pr prospective applicants. So if you've got particular questions, like the kind of things people are raising here, but when they've actually started the gathering their evidence and feel more ready to go forward with the process, come to one of the Q&As. We do our best to answer your question. So we're trying to um, get to the, to the place where we're only having applicants come forward who are ready for assessment um, so that we have a very high, as I say, success rate. Um, I mentioned assessment advisors a number of times and said I'd come back to them. So here I am coming back to them. Um, applicants um, can um, take up one day of support from a trained assessment advisor and go back to training, how important it is to have people who understand the assessment process carrying it out. Only trained assessors can be assessment advisors um, and they will focus their support on the assessment process. They can help you review examples of your written and video evidence, um, identify any gaps in that. They can give you feedback on the written and video evidence and they can conduct a mock interview. Because we pay our assessors, not very much, <laughs> relatively speaking, but we do pay people to do this work because we feel that it is important that we, in effect, take out a contract with them to do the work in the prescribed amount of time and using the required documentation, et cetera. Um, then obviously there is a cost um, to applicants and, and we understand that that, that, that uh, you know, that is a commitment that we're asking people to make, but we're not prepared um, to go back to the kind of bad old days where people were doing this uh, in their own time out of, uh, you know, they just basically were being asked to take part in this. They weren't properly supported and trained. You know, we're not going to do that again. It's, it wasn't right years ago and it's certainly not going to be happening now. So we do have to pass on um, some costs to applicants. And this is one example of that. But it'd be a day, it's a day of support. It'd be a day very well spent for people who feel that they need that bit of confidence to actually get to grips with it and go forward. And I think someone's question already has highlighted this it is about confidence and there is a history here um, in the sense of people perhaps feeling that in the past they didn't have a good experience I, I can hand on heart tell you that in all the work that I've done in putting this process together and working with the team of people who've helped me to do this that is, that is our you know absolutely fundamental uh, goal and aim here. Um, we want it to be done properly and professionally and for you to get, you know, the best uh, quality of service in terms of assessment that we can give you. And, and that is our aim. And um, as I say, there's the, 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 res the downside of that is that people are, given a set amount of time to carry out the assessments, they are paid for the assessments, uh, to, to carry out the assessments. But as I say, that means then that we can have a formal contract with them and they have to do um, what they say they're gonna do um, in, in the time that they, they, they say they will. So there was a question earlier about when the windows are. So <clears throat> there are uh, three windows a year at the moment. 
And we're currently just come to the end of the January, February 2021 uh, applications. So that those are the two months when people send in the form, say they want the assessment in this window, send in the case records, send in the video evidence. So that uh, has, has happened. The people who put themselves forward, who submitted their evidence, we're now into April, um, uh, sorry, March and April part of the window. So we're now reviewing that evidence and setting up the oral interviews, and that will all be um, completed by the end of April. So the next window begins 1st of May, and you can tell us that you would like to be assessed and provide us with your written and or, uh, or video evidence between the 1st of May and the 30th of June. And as soon as you put your evidence in, you'll be allocated assessors and the process will be underway so that it would, will be um, completed uh, as soon as possible, as I say, once you put your evidence in, but uh, definitely by July, August. And then the next window starts September, October. So you get two months to put your evidence in, but the sooner you put it in, the sooner the process starts, the sooner it gets completed. And then um, that window ends November, December, and then we start again, happy days, 2022. Um, so, as I said, uh, because of all of those things that I've, I've said and because we are paying assessors to do this job properly, the cost for the assessment process is significant. Um, I, I, I won't um, you know, pretend it isn't, that, that that's a, a significant um, amount. And um, it covers all the costs of paying the assessors and administration and so on, the costs that the ABBC incurs. Um, but we're trying to support people in the process. You can either pay it in one amount or it can be subdivided and paid in three installments so that it can be um, se separated out when the application is received, then when you put the evidence in and then when the oral interviews. Uh, are arranged and the APBC office will be very happy to give you um, further details on that process and, and how to do that. So, um, questions on that then? Okay, so um, Jennifer's on fire tonight. She said, is that the same cost for um, APBC members? Um, the, um, currently, the APBC is um, able to reduce the cost for its provisional members in this current year because it has funds to do that. But every year the cost will be reviewed and obviously the reduction in fees for APBC members um, is, is subject to an annual, annual review based on what the organisation can, can support in terms of its financial um, status. But at the moment, it is less for APBC provisional members than for people coming from the outside. And of course, um, the other thing is that if you're already a provisional member, you haven't got to go through that first bit of the assessment uh, of knowledge and understanding that's done. Yeah. Whereas if you come to us directly off the streets, as it were, or out of the paddock, um, <laughs> It, we, we have to deal with that, the knowledge and understanding part as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And actually, I think, you know, paying, uh, just talking personally, paying to get the support through the process as well is actually a really good investment for somebody going through it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with assessors charging, I think. Um, no, as I say, the, 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 our, our day rate is is pretty minimal, um, but people are... are you know, engaging with that and, and doing it yeah. partly because people are committed to doing it properly. Um, and obviously at some point in the future, you know, all these things were subject to review in terms of what um, assessors are paid. But um, what I would say is we are busy training up new assessors all the time. And um, we, need, we, need more, we need more horse assessors. So get in there, guys. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm for this. It's, it's, it's brilliant CPD being an assessor, like I said. It's just, I 
and the, and the dialogues that you have and the conversations you have with people um just just absolutely brilliant it really makes you proud to be part of the organization and and the sector because you know there's such a lot of expertise yeah people know such a lot it's brilliant yeah well, it sounds it so great cpd as you're doing it as well oh yeah and everyone has said that the feedback that we've had from people they all said that they really found the process valuable that the feedback that they've had has been um, really clear and helpful and valuable and that going through the interviews as themselves even though you know it's bound to be a little bit traumatic yeah (laughs) because you so want to get through it and you so want to succeed we understand that um but the the actual feedback that they get and the dialogue and the discussions we have and like i said if we discuss um different case scenarios and so on everyone has felt that the process itself has been valuable in its own right yeah that's really good Really good. I have one more question for you from me, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, that's OK. Once you're a full member, how yeah. many cases a year do you need to um, see to stay on as a full member? I ask this because I've had a few inquiries from people who are practising part time who've been worried about I might go through this whole process, get certified and then find out that um, I'm not seeing enough cases every year to stay on a, you know, as a member. Yeah, we, we don't do certification, okay? We yeah. assess people as clinical animal behaviourists or animal behaviour technicians. Can you, see the, can you see the slap? Sorry. That's me slap. Yeah, that was my naughty use of the word certify. Yeah, it's the extra C which we don't yeah. talk about. But anyway. Um, uh, no, um, we, don't, we don't set that down um, apart from obviously um, through the CPD requirements annually. Um, And we are reviewing those at the moment as well, because uh, for any of you who are um, vets, you will know that RCVS has completely revamped its approach to CPD and it's created an app so that um, vets can record their CPD. They don't even have to write it down, they just talk into the app. and they've allowed, there are categories of CPD, uh, and, and we clearly have uh, categories of CPD, as does uh, ABTC. Um, but we're coming, you know, to the view that people should be treated as professionals and be able to make their own decisions about what CPD they need. And the same thing would be true in terms of them maintaining their clinical um, competence. Yeah. So yeah. if you're yeah. no longer in practice, uh, clearly you can't, you know, you yeah. shouldn't yeah. be remaining as a full member, but we do not specify that. Yeah, no, I think this is more coming from people that were working, say, in another job part time and wanted to, yeah. you know, so they will still be practicing regularly, but they might, if there was a set number of cases, they might struggle. So, no, there um, isn't. No, yeah, there isn't a set number of cases. That is really good to hear. Um, I have a question that's probably me, more me than you, um, only because so somebody's asked, do you find it an issue that it's like, unlikely that a horse owner would mention to their vet about behaviour issues and they're more likely to find a local trainer, perhaps a natural horsemanship trainer? Um, is anything being done to address this issue and raise the profile of cabs and ABTs amongst horse owners? So this is definitely an issue. Um, and this is why the Horse Trust is, is also working. Um, so we're working to help support people through coming cabs. We want more cabs out there. That will help to raise, raise awareness to the vets. We're also working um, on the veterinary side to raise awareness um, of, of the need to um, refer clients to, you know, suitably qualified people, i.e. ABTC registered practitioners. Um, so, yes, so work is being done, but it is, it is a problem. And a lot of horse owners, by the time they see a cab, will have gone through every other possible option um, mm. that they can, you know, for a source of advice that they can try. So it is definitely not an, um, an issue and we are, we are working on it. Um, Jane, did you want to go through the rest of your slides? Yeah, I just got a I couple got... more and then we can wrap up with the other questions. I just wanted to um, um, just, uh, you know, summarise really the APBC membership offer because, um, and, and of course this stuff here applies largely to um 
to all levels of membership, not the group insurance policy. OK, um, that is for um, that's not for student student um, members, but um, all the other stuff is uh, it, um, once you become a full member, obviously, you also additionally get ABTC practitioner registration and recognition, ABBC membership and rec recognition. Our webinars program is brilliant if you haven't looked at it. Uh, lately the, the, and you can watch them any time you can watch them live or you can watch them recorded um, and their full price is £35 outside of ABTC um, but for our members they're 1250 I mean you know if you think about student or a provisional membership level and how much you're going to save by 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 that it, it's just a no-brainer that one um, there's always reduced rates for members on on conferences we have member events like the Q&As which are free um, and the biggie that has just come out literally, <clears throat> um, I think the email came out yesterday, is <clears throat> that the committee has just decided, we just uh, <clears throat> voted to pay for access to journals uh, for our members because it is difficult to access some of them. And so all ABBC members are now going to get access to Anthrozoos, Applied Animal Behaviour Science and the Journal of Veterinary Behaviour as part of their membership fee. I just think that's brilliant. Um, we've also got the group insurance policy, which is obviously, because uh, it's a group, you get a reduction. There's a wellbeing service, so you can um, sign up to, to that. Um, there is a fee for that, but it's all about supporting those of us who work um, in isolation, particularly, you know, because a lot of us work um, uh, separately from, from each other and to, to help you maintain your own health and, and well-being. There's the local groups, the social media groups, the support groups I've mentioned uh, and the articles library and I know you know about these because they're all in conjunction with the Horse Trust but this is just um, uh, a little sample of what's coming up in terms of APBC equine events. So we are really trying to um, make a good offer to equine focused members uh, <clears throat> and uh, members and so we got the the three upcoming equine um, webinars and of course later this year we got the equine conference so um, that's the contact information for the APBC which is on the slides and uh, this is the final one that I was asked to put in so Thank you very much. So we've obviously blown everybody away. We haven't got any more questions. Uh, well, we've just all of it. floored them. It was just so much. It was. Um, but that was actually, it was. Uh, it was brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and if, uh, if anyone else has um, questions about um, any of this process after the webinar that you think of anything, then you can always um, drop me a line. Um, so, um, Jane, you can pop up that last slide, could you? Because it's got my email address on. I will. Hold on. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you haven't already, if you um, if you want to stay up to date with the the clinical animal behaviour work, the uh, the webinars and um, on the case studies and um, and the reach to becoming a cab that we're doing, if you follow the Talk Equine with the Horse Trust Facebook page, we put all the updates on there. Our next events a case study webinar being delivered by veterinary behaviourist Gemma Pearson. And she's going to be discovering, uh, discovering, I've invented a new word, um, discussing um, a case involving a horse bolted under saddle. Um, if you've got any feedback for us on any of the webinars or you want to suggest future topics, um, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is up there or you can send me a message on the Horse Trust Facebook page. Um, the recording for this will be sent to you and it will be available for three months and we'll also put it on our website. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And Jane, you've been fab. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really good of you to come and listen. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye. Stop sharing.